today. Uh, I have um, been fascinated and amazed by some of the things I've seen over the course of this week, clearly very different to this topic that I'm going to be telling you about. So my job is really to convince you that you should maybe put aside that uh, uh, algorithmic first approach and think a little bit more or incorporate people a little bit more into the design and development work that you do and will do in the future going forward. Um, I hope Jen motivated you a bit more as well about what can go wrong when you don't do that. What I'm going to do is talk through some examples of methodologies that are uh, typical in the field of human-computer interaction. I'm going to show you some examples of how we have uh, applied that type of methodology. And what I'm trying to do is convince you that that can really lead to very valuable outcomes at the end of that work. First, though, uh, a bit of context. You may remember this photo from Matt's talk earlier in the day. Um, this is a place called Daravi. Daravi is a, a large informal settlement, uh, or often called a slum, in uh, Mumbai. It's one of the largest in India, uh, actually in, in the whole of the world, probably. Uh, it's about one square mile in area, or maybe two-ish square kilometers, that sort of space. And within that area, there is a population of around 700,000 to a million people, depending on the estimate that you read. So it's incredibly densely populated. Okay? Because of that, the typical resident of Darabi lives in a single room home, a very compact space. It's normally a shared space, so you would live with family, maybe friends, maybe co-workers. With less access to uh, constant power supplies, constant network connections, uh, less constancy in many of the things that you and I probably, well, except for with load shedding, le less constancy with many of the things that we expect in our day-to-day -day life. And the reason I'm showing you this is actually because at first glance, this might not seem like somewhere where an AI-driven system is particularly uh, probable. It might not seem like the sort of place where uh, it might be the focus of someone doing development of uh, AI or machine learning driven systems. Um, and actually, that is, in many people's approach, quite uh, the norm. So it's not uh, typically the case that you would see uh, research or applications of more advanced technologies in someone like Baravi. There's been a very um, long history of an assumption that technology will just trickle down, and at some point in the near or maybe far future, people in places like Daravi will eventually have access to the sorts of things that we have today. So our yesterday is the today in somewhere like Daravi. Think back again to what Matt said earlier, that, that, uh, that vision designed in California. So I'm sure many of you looked at the back of your phones, laptops, tablets, and saw that phrase. And what that statement, what that, that brand is trying to imply is that California really is this magical place where innovation just ripples out of everything and everywhere. And what happens there somehow gets spread out to all of us all over the world. And we eagerly sort of lap up these amazing ideas and, and uh, innovations that are coming out of this, this Californian mindset. Now, of course, you might be saying you looked at the back of your phone and uh, maybe rather than designed in California, it says designed in Cape Town. Maybe it says designed in London or wherever it is that you are from. I think probably... For most of us in this room, it doesn't really matter whether it says design in California or anywhere else. We have a very similar mindset, way of life, and understanding of what technology is and can do. I have certainly used almost all the devices that I see in the room in front of all of you, and I probably suggest that's the same for everyone here. You know what things can and can't do. You know what technology can be applied to. 
Maybe you have an idea of what might be possible in the future, but you're pretty familiar with what is possible in the relatively short term. We have the same sort of standard of living, the same outlook, the same access to the things that we uh, have around us. Our approach in the research that we've been doing for the past 10, 15 years is to flip that on its head. So rather than starting with a deep understanding of technology and the way that it has and can be used, our approach is to start with people in places such as Baravi and elsewhere, um, like Matt mentioned, Langer, Kalicha, other uh, townships in uh, and around Cape Town, to focus on people and places in those sorts of areas to come up with innovation. And the reason for that is that people who have less familiarity and understanding with uh, all sorts of technologies are very, very often freer and more able to come up with uh, interesting and innovative ideas about what technology can be applied to. And our position is that, uh, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail, our position is that through starting with people in uh, areas that are less uh, sorry, more constrained, less uh, familiar with access to technology, you can then almost uh, sort of democratize design and innovation because people who have less baggage, less uh, familiarity with technology come up with more innovative ideas. And if you take one thing from this talk and ignore everything else I say, that I would say is the key, the key lesson of this talk. The methodology that uh, I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk is something that we've come to term itinerative design. And it's kind of summarized by the little uh, diagram I showed you on the previous slide. The, the term itinerative uh, comes from two words. Itinerant, meaning moving from place to place, uh, engaging with lots of people in different areas uh, of the world. And then also the word iterative, which means repeated, uh, repeating, and uh, in our case, iteratively improving and refining uh, designs and ideas that people have come up with. The first step of uh, the types of methodologies that we uh, most commonly employ is to start with local innovation. And most often that takes place in this sort of setting. So this is a design workshop in a, in a room in a community center in Daravi. And the key thing to notice here is that there is absolutely no sign of any type of technology. There are people sitting in a room and uh, discussing and thinking and trying to almost forget about what exists and what currently is possible. And I think actually that's not just a, uh, a perspective that uh, comes out of uh, the sorts of areas that Jen, myself, Thomas, and Matt work in. It's not just the case that people who are sort of human computer interaction specialists think like that. Listening to the talk yesterday uh, about explainable AI, it was fascinating to see, uh, I can't remember the, the exact example, but a combination of visualizations of effectiveness of a particular algorithm and um, Inga was explaining how the, the more familiar example of the, the ship versus the, the heat map versus the, the chart, the familiar things, the everyday things, uh, are the ones that were most meaningful and most useful to people. But uh, sitting in a room and talking about uh, ideas doesn't necessarily get you to a really uh, amazing uh, novel technology. So how do you actually come up with ideas? How do you apply uh, human-centered methods and think about technology and people and how they might work together? Think about what Matt did earlier today where he got you to uh, take a piece of paper and sketch out uh, your idea of your house of the future. Now, I was struck by the variability of the different ideas that people came up with. There. So people talked about smart homes, eco homes, but also the vast array of, I mean, I looked around afterwards at some of the sketches that were on the tables. It was a very effective way of uh, getting people to think about the future of technology. And it's something that we will do repeatedly with 
uh, people to get them to almost, almost free their minds and think beyond what they have at the moment. Here's a very simple example of uh, a worksheet where we've asked people to reflect on their day-to-day -day life and their, their lived experiences and their challenges and the types of things that they experience day to day. Um, I'm not sure whether this is readable, but this is another example of a type of sketching application where it, it says on there, if I could travel to the future five years from now and make a mobile specially for me, I would like it to look like and to work like this. So that means a, a mobile phone of the future. I wasn't actually going to do this, but we have a little bit more time than I thought. So I'm going to ask you to do this task. I'm hoping that you have a little bit of paper on the table still, and maybe a pen from the previous uh, session. But I'm actually going to test out this right now. So I will give you five minutes, and I would like you to draw what you imagine your mobile phone of the future. Uh, and it says, five years from now. So think about what you have now, what you, what you understand about technology, and draw your phone of the future five years from now. So as you might expect, just like Matt, I am going to come round and pick on people randomly. Uh, we can only do the blank paper thing once, so uh, hopefully some people have got some sketches. So this is a good one here. This is a sketch that says, no gadget. What did you mean by that? It's overwhelming. It's becoming so. It's, be, it's become ubiquitous? Or you mean it's disappeared? Okay, so the, the phone has disappeared from your life. Okay, so an example here of being perfectly happy with the current device. So a rectangle with a bit of glass on the front and a touch screen. That's perfectly fine. Anyone else? I'll, I'll have one more example. Anyone draw on their phone? Yes. Do you want me to give you the microphone? Okay, so this one is small enough because I have really small hands and I struggle to hold a lot of uh, other devices. So it folds in half and can fit in my one hand. And then it has like a holographic screen so that like if you need a bigger screen, it can easily expand but without using like materials. And it's made from recycled materials because a lot of phone materials are like causing havoc in the environment. So something that's like easily recyclable, something that maybe can have different sizes if it gets made for different people so that it's not like a lot of things. And then like a very thick screen protector so that it doesn't break. <laughs> Excellent. So thank you very much for sharing that. Uh, what I'd like to do now, if I can get back to the turn. What I'd like to do now is show you some of the examples that people in our workshops came up with uh, not that slide, uh, this slide. So I, I went to three different people. One uh, phone had sort of disappeared entirely. One was basically the same as it is now. And the other was, uh, I would say, uh, maybe an extension of what we have now to have more features in the way it might work and the 
type of display. People in places like Langer and Daravi came up with an immense range of different ideas about what mobile devices might be in the future. And what you can see here is a selection of some of the things that um, have come up over the times that we've done this type of activity. So you can see here almost nothing that is actually your typical rectangular glass screen with touch and apps and all of those sorts of things. What you see are, I would argue, really very imaginative types of interfaces and use cases for mobile devices of some form or another. So for example, what you can see in the top left is a mobile phone that's in the shape of a hand. And it's in the shape of a hand because the hand is very uh, able to deform, to, to change shape. So this person saw the phone as almost uh, cupping them when they talked on the phone, but it's also uh, able to be uh, manipulated depending on the context uh, of use. One in the top right here. This is an example, uh, actually this is, uh, I think, from Langer, uh, where people were interested in the idea of separating the display and the data of their mobile device. And when you think about it, the important bit of your phone really is the data. It's not the display, it's not the camera, it's not the sort of advanced capabilities that this device has. The bit that you really can't actually just replace is the personal part of that, the bit that really is special to you. And this person's idea was to have that personal part maybe as a necklace or as something they wore around their wrist. And as they went around and maybe they went to a friend's house, they could pick up their friend's phone and see their own data on that phone. Maybe they could see, uh, go up to a, a laptop or a television screen and see their own content on a different device. And that was a really imaginative idea, we thought. The ability to separate these uh, uh, incredibly interlinked things uh, into different conceptual parts. Uh, what else do we have here? So in the bottom center, uh, we have a, um, actually I should have got a video of this, a, a more uh, eccentric idea about a mobile device that rather than actually having any type of screen or interactive uh, function, was able to uh, manipulate everyday materials, uh, things like uh, salt or grains or uh, types of materials, into displays and interactive services. So the phone itself was, again, very small, uh, but able to control things around it to create input and output. All of these things, uh, I would argue, and actually what I'm trying to tell you throughout this talk, we couldn't really have come up with those ideas were we to sit in a room with like-minded people and try and think about the future of technology. We might have got somewhere close to some of these ideas, but without that lived context and experience, and most importantly, the lack of familiarity of what is and is not possible uh, was incredibly freeing in this type of workshop. And of course, you do also sometimes get things like, my phone will allow me to time travel. To some extent, the idea that you came up with, the uh, my phone will have a holographic display that could be uh, large and uh, show way beyond the area of the device. People sometimes free their minds a little too much, and you have to think about what might be feasible. So the next step of the, the method that we most often undertake is to uh, get people to share their ideas with each other. Uh, I've kind of done that a little bit by getting people to report back. But look, I'm talking to you, you're sitting there in silence. It's not really a discussion about the future of technology. So we use a method that's uh, very common in HCI called uh, dialogue labs. Uh, and getting that, that, what that does is getting people to sit together, discuss a topic, and come up with uh, ways to refine and shape ideas. Um, that's all very well to discuss about what might be possible. But it's very important, I would argue, to go a bit beyond that and think about the actual practicality of how things might be used. Um, you'll notice I have not shown you any technology at all so far throughout this.
talk. And I'm going to continue that theme by thinking about um, uh, prototyping and simulation of ideas. Uh, this photo is of someone in Langer imagining what their future uh, mobile device might actually be. And you probably can't see it on the photo, but they've got a, on their wrist a, uh, uh, it's simply a bit of paper wrapped around their wrist. Uh, and the idea in this workshop is that people are imagining that this gadget that they're wearing can do whatever they want it to do. And thinking about how that might actually work in practice. This is a really valuable uh, type of activity, the sort of uh, imagining and acting out interactive devices. And we've done this in all sorts of places. What I'm going to do now, though, is, look, I'm very well aware I've talked to you about sort of more conceptual types of interaction design. I'm going to go a bit um, more specific and turn to what Thomas is going to talk about tomorrow and think about a particular type of interaction. And that is uh, a voice-based interactive system. Uh, in many of the workshops that we've run uh, over the years, we have started with a general type of technology area that people are interested in uh, using in their everyday lives. And in this one, uh, it was speech and language technology. Uh, and the reason for this was that people uh, in uh, Dharavi had very little access to voice-based interactive systems. But there are clear attractive aspects of these uh, interactive devices. So imagine speaking, uh, sorry, imagine not having a particularly strong literacy or technology familiarity. Imagine being able to speak to or instruct uh, a mobile or, or a computer to do something in your own language. Clearly that's a particularly attractive idea. But as I kind of outlined earlier, uh, it's probably not very feasible in somewhere like the RV for everyone to have access to voice-driven systems. Certainly things like uh, Alexa or Google Home, those sorts of devices, are probably not likely to happen in somewhere like the RV. Not least because there's not space, there's not constant power, there's not constant internet connection for them to actually work. What we were doing in this uh, activity here was asking people to imagine how that might work in all the sorts of contexts that they were familiar with. Uh, and this was called a technology walk. What this is, is taking something like a voice uh, interactive device and, as the name implies, walking around Dharavi and thinking, well, imagine I could talk to a computer in this particular location. How might that work? What might that do? What might enable me to do in my day-to-day uh, -day life? I said at the start I'd talk to you about uh, three different types of things, from ideation to prototyping and deployments. I'm going to focus now on prototyping. So I mentioned that that was a voice interactive system and people were thinking about how the, that could work in their everyday lives. How do you actually find out the answer to that question? How might things work in people's everyday lives without actually having to build the entire thing. So look, you are all very experienced in, uh, in, in uh, machine learning and AI uh, development. Maybe you can go out and build this sort of interactive device. But we certainly couldn't at that stage, not uh, straightforwardly anyway. And so what we did was to fall back on a very um, useful and well-used uh, uh, HCI research method. And I will illustrate it with this photo. Does anyone know what this photo is from? Anyone want to say what this photo is from? This photo is from the film, The Wizard of Oz. And I don't know whether you know the story of The Wizard of Oz, but uh, the story is that uh, this, this girl in the center meets, uh, uh, gets transported to a faraway land, and she meets this set of intrepid adventurers, and they end up searching for this renowned wizard who is all-powerful and able to do uh, all sorts of things. And they do an awful lot of things at his bidding by, because they're sort of uh, intimidated by what he can do, his incredible uh, capabilities. Um, it turns out, 
uh, I'm sorry if this is a spoiler, I'm hope hopefully it isn't. Actually, it's just a small, shy looking man behind a curtain pulling levers and pressing buttons and making things happen. That is what uh, we do very often in HCI uh, systems. Early on in the development of uh, all sorts of uh, interactive devices, it is very useful if you don't actually have to build something. Because what that lets you do is understand how it may, might work before you have put the effort in to actually develop uh, all of the interaction, all of the uh, sort of supporting technology in the background. And this is one of the very earliest uh, applications of this type of method in computer science. And I thought I'd put this photo on because it's interesting that this is also a voice-based interactive system. What's going on here is that the person on the left is uh, a user of this, uh, what's called a listening typewriter. You can tell how old it is just from the name. And this person is speaking, and you can see there's a microphone there, and they've been told that the computer is listening to them and can understand what they are saying. What they don't know is that behind this partition in the middle, is someone on the other side who's just got a speaker <coughs> that plays what they say in the microphone. And when they hear something being said, they type, and what they type is fed back to the person on the other side. And so through that method, the person on the left is given the impression that the thing that they're using is working when actually it's entirely human-powered, entirely simulated. So in our exploration of uh, voice-based systems, we've used exactly the same method. And you may recognize this photo that Matt showed earlier. It's an incredibly powerful method because it allowed us to create this voice-based system in a public space in Dharavi uh, and deploy what we uh, positioned as a general purpose speech-based interactive system uh, that worked with near perfect accuracy and amazing general knowledge, but in reality was uh, Rini and Bakati sitting uh, on the other end of a telephone call with a Bluetooth speaker in the box and responding to people's interactions and queries. And you might think, well, why, why do that? I mean, why not just, if you're not going to be able to build something that really can do and understand and say everything, I mean, why not start with something that's actually practical and actually viable at the end of the day? Well, the reason for this is that you can understand an awful lot about the way that people and technology work together through this type of method. So we were able to find out about the types of interactions that people would undertake with this type of system. And you might say, well, OK, that's relatively obvious, right? People ask for basic facts in voice systems. People ask about specific types of queries. But more um, interesting and insightful were the uh, things that helped us redesign and refine the interaction for this particular context in Dharavi. So things like uh, how you might uh, elicit queries from people and how the system might respond to particular types of interaction are something that we could only discover through actually deploying a system, but without having to build it first. Uh, we could discover those things and then fine-tune our, de uh, our development towards that particular type of application. Um, I'm coming towards the end of my time, so what I'm going to do is skip forward a little bit to this particular uh, example. Um, so, after... Uh, developing this Wizard of Oz based system. Of course, we are real computer scientists, and so we wanted to de design and actually build an interactive system uh, from the lessons that we learned in that Wizard of Oz uh, prototype. But one of the key things that we learned in Theravi was about the, uh, the, the sorts of things that would really not be possible for us to do uh, with a, um, an, a sort of fully machine-powered uh, interactive system. You've probably used uh, Alexa and uh, OK Google and all these sorts of things, and uh, I'm sure you've experienced that they're not entirely useless, but not that great in many senses. 
Imagine putting that in a context where it has almost no knowledge about the situation and almost no knowledge about the types of interactions that people might do. It would work far um, less well. So what we decided to do was actually involve people, again, in the way that this system worked. Uh, the two different devices that you can see here are ways of interacting with the voice system in a public space in Darabi. And what we designed them to do was uh, to, for someone to walk up, for someone to press a button and ask a question and then get an answer from uh, this system. But uh, because we uh, had been able to go to this Wizard of Oz prototype uh, in advance of this, we decided to actually involve people in the, in the responses to this system. So when you press the button on this system, what you actually get, rather than a purely machine-powered answer, what you actually get is a ticket printing out that gives you a number. And in the background, our system is sending your voice query off to a person who is listening to what you've said. And then they provide a voice response to that query. And then when you return to the box later on, you say your number into it rather than the question, and it will play you the voice response the, to the question or the interaction that you had. We deployed this system in uh, places over therapy for uh, a few days, and it was pretty much a complete failure. It was uh, a great example of why you do need to test things with people. Uh, connectivity was unreliable, batteries ran out, APIs didn't particularly work very well, uh, people got confused with the state and the interaction, ticket printers jammed, uh, recognition of numbers didn't really work, and people got very confused with how the system, uh, the status of the system, and how things uh, were actually meant to be used. This was a really critical part of this particular study. What we, what we designed this system to do was to be able to be deployed in the sort of environment that we had thought we'd understood from the Wizard of Oz study and also from our own experience in places like Barrowby. But it was a complete failure nonetheless. This is a really important part of human-centered research trying things with people and <laughs> watching them fail and being uh, almost surprised by the way that people interact with systems. People almost never interact with things in the way that you think they will interact. So uh, actually one of the, um, I don't know whether Thomas will cover this example, but one of, the, uh, one of the most surprising things that we encountered in this type of interaction was that when people, we asked people to press the button on this box, and the first reaction was, well, which button? Now, I don't know about you, but in either of the systems, I can only see one button. But uh, people thought the, the grill might be a button, the white bits might be a button, the holes for the microphone might be a button. The people that you design your interactive systems for and with are almost never uh, from the same type of understanding background as you, and can be incredibly creative in the way that they manage to make things go wrong for you. I'm sure you'll experience this in, in your own work, in the types of um, the variability of, of uh, data um, sources, data collections that you have to work with. Humans are imed incredibly imaginative and able to break all of the things that you build. But I suppose a key lesson from this is to not be deterred, to iterate and refine and create new versions of the things that you want to build, and then to experiment with those uh, after learning about the types of things that people will and will not do. So I'm not going to uh, take all of Thomas's uh, slides for tomorrow. I'll leave him to talk about the, uh, the implementation and the studies of what we've done with this particular um, application. Um, but we deployed uh, these interactive devices in a large number of places all across Darabi, 
for a, a longitudinal period. And again, you are constantly surprised by the types of situations and scenarios that people and the environment manage to throw at you. But what this really helps you do is, uh, is get better, is iterate, is improve, is make the things that you are developing more suitable, more robust, and more able to cope with everyday life. And the, the great thing about this is that after several uh, phases of workshops and simulated systems and uh, failures and better and better applications, both in the interaction and the uh, background uh, system powering this, we were able to produce something that was incredibly um, widely used across Darby. So this is 12,000 interactions over the course of that 40-day period. And remember, this is not people using a web service. This is people actually approaching something physical, pressing a button, and speaking to it. Um, and it was also able to really give an insight into the types of um, interactions and applications and uh, needs of this type of device in that type of context. Now look, I'm, I'm aware that I've had to give you a very brief overview of this whole research area and this whole methodology in, what is it, 30 minutes. And I'm very happy to talk about this in more depth afterwards with any of you. But I think what I'd like to, to just reiterate at the end of this talk is that we are all very similar in mindset and outlook, and probably we would all make very similar mistakes in the way that we design interactive or non-interactive systems and services because we have this mindset, we have this familiarity with how things work. What we've done in our research is work with people who don't have that, and that has been the most valuable part of all of this research. Insights from uh, people who really have a different lived experience can be valuable, not just to their particular context, but also to, to us. We have benefited greatly from those understandings of how technology work and don't work. And so I really hope that uh, maybe in the next five years, 10 years, maybe we might start to see things that don't just say design in California, but maybe they just do say things like designed in Darby, maybe, maybe even designed in Stellenbosch by people who came to this event. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, did you end up implementing some of these phones, or do you have an example of of uh, some of, some of the stuff you did that ended up in an uh, actual product or something? Yes and no. So yeah, all of the things that I showed you on those sketch slides we did implement. Uh, they're all in research papers, and we haven't yet had anything. Uh, in a sort of real commercial product, if that's what you're, you're referring to. But yes, we did implement all of those things uh, to the prototype stage, so the same sort of stage as um, I showed you in the second half of the talk. But it's, but it's not something you're going to continue to work on to actually make a phone like a glove or something like, I don't know. A phone like? There was like a glove phone, I don't know, part of the hand, I don't know. Sure, yeah. So Just any of the ideas that you, or like you got an idea from any of this that you were actually... So you know, I would say the one that we have taken most, uh, the most advanced is the idea of separating the sort of data versus the, the screen and the camera or the, the other components of the device. And the challenge you have when you want to go beyond the prototype stage there is that... Uh, we are not a mobile phone network or manufacturer or any of those types of uh, organization. And because of that, we have to work within the boundaries of things like Android frameworks or um, operating system uh, um, 
permissions and things like that. And so we have taken them to the maximum extent that we have been able to do. But that doesn't mean you can't actually sort of deploy in, in, a, in a real sense. It's often quite, um, you can often be quite imaginative with how you approach these ideas and create prototypes that essentially work to the level that people would be able to use them on a day-to-day -day basis. But then the next step, uh, no, we haven't done that yet. Uh, hello. Uh, one of the devices, they said like you have to wait for 10 minutes and then come back and speak it in English. Could you explain like why uh, it was like that for after 10 minutes? So yeah, I didn't cover that in a huge amount of detail and I, I can totally understand why that might be confusing. The, the idea was that we wanted to be able to actually answer people's questions. Uh, and in order to do that, we had to involve people in that in some way. But getting people in an actual deployment to be able to answer things in real time would be near impossible. So we, uh, it was almost crowdsourcing answers to questions and then be able to provide them back to people. And so that was the reason to have that 10 minute delay. And Thomas, in fact, will talk in more detail, I think, tomorrow about that sort of interaction model and how that can work with uh, a combination of people and AI powered uh, questions and answers. To, let's say somewhat political questions and we're doing that kind of uh, methodology as well so it affects all of us but I'm always curious to see how other people handle that you start from a very um, let's say people empowering uh, starting point um, and it's it comes across as this very ethical position uh, we want to do things better for people with people etc and then you go into a design exercise with a fundamentally affirmative um, point of view. Voice activated devices are a good thing. So we want to design them better somehow. Mobile phones are here to stay. The, they will solve our problems or they will answer some need. So we should design mobile phones. And uh, so how do you deal in the team when you start out on an exercise with that um, not really avoidable affirmative bias for that kind of methodology? Um, and the second question is, uh, you go to these very poor people and they help you get research papers. What do you give back? Yeah, there's two very good questions uh, that we do have to uh, approach with all of the research that we do. So the first one was uh, this sort of, we're, we're coming with a positive mindset that the, the, the thing that we're doing is a good idea. I would definitely say we are, we are approaching this with, with the mindset that technological development is, in some sense, a good idea. We are computer scientists. We are interested in uh, developing and refining technology. But it's not the case that in that particular example, we uh, are def deciding that speech-based interfaces are a good idea. That type of application was something that people in our workshops uh, came up with. So yes, on the technology side, but no, definitely not on the specific application or idea of how things might work. Uh, as I kind of outlined at the start, the main idea was to start with no sort of preconceptions, no particular thing as an example of how uh, interaction, of, of what we might create, and to let people, participants in these uh, workshops, actually uh, lead the way towards what uh, might actually be produced at the end. In terms of the second question, yes, also a, a great one. So, look, the, the research team, in our case, the, the few of us, and also local researchers uh, collaborating, do all benefit in terms of our careers, and also we are paid to do this work, right? So there is a, an imbalance there in uh, the, um, the benefit. Uh, what we, the way that we approach that particular um, challenge is by 
firstly, by paying participants. Uh, it may seem like a basic thing, but that is a, a, obviously something we must do. We must pay for people's time, people's effort, and participation in all of the activities that we do. The second thing is that everything that we produce as a result of this is published as a research paper, but also published in the most open way we are uh, able to do, in that we release all of the uh, designs, uh, source code, uh, uh, other resources associated with these ideas. So yes, uh, there is that uh, sort of tension in that we are benefiting from the participation. But our hope is that uh, both participants and ourselves will mutually benefit in that the uh, ideas that we create are not locked up in some sort of intellectual property minefield, but they are open and available for anyone who might benefit from those ideas to take forward.